I'm here with Henrike Hahn. She is a German member of the European Parliament and has been since 2019. And she campaigns for green industrial policy and the ecological social transformation of the economy. So that's a lot. And it's what's brought you to the US. So welcome to DC. Mm -hmm. And talk to us in our audience a little bit about what's brought you here, what you're hoping to accomplish. I think what is very important, I mean, we Greens fight in the European Parliament for climate and environment, and I think transatlantic cooperation really is a big plus that we can use to fight against climate change. And this is what I came for, also to talk to the industry, to talk to politicians, to talk to agencies, what we can do, you know, focusing on economy, uh, because there's so many instruments and tools and possibilities to fight together against climate change. And this is why I'm here to learn and that we can learn from each other. Oh my gosh, I love, I'm already engaged. This is fantastic. The, I wanna know more. So tell us about this learning from each other and how that concept fuels this just transition that's really core and important to what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, just transition, that is something that is exceptional because it was um, you know, established by the European Union recently. I worked on that as well. So the just transition program means like that we have funds, means 17.5 billion euro just for the just transition process. And that is financed in part by the EU budget and in part by the European recovery instrument. And uh, it also will initiate um, investments of 30 billion euro additionally. And um, it is provided you know, to support the just transition process, to support small and medium enterprises, to support research and development, to support the decarbonization of institutions, reskilling and upskilling of workers means you know, all what is affected by um, bringing um, us in Europe to the decarbonization and to uh, achieve at least the Paris climate goals. Okay, that's fantastic, because we talk about that to some extent here in the US. We have the Justice 40 framework, where we're trying to make sure that at least 40% of federal investments in this clean energy transition is returned to those who have been historically disenfranchised in the US, that workers really benefit from it, communities benefit from some of these different um, projects that are being invested in, especially around critical mining, critical minerals mining. And so talk to us a little bit about critical minerals. Why do we need a reliable supply? And why in the process of excavating critical minerals do we need to make sure that the, uh, that the outcomes are really justly, justly enjoyed? Oh, that's very interesting because first of all, we really need critical raw materials also for green technology means like with the Green Deal that we have now on the table, which is relevant for Europe and the United States as well, of course, we need critical raw materials because it is used, for example, in wind turbines, in, uh, for technology, uh, for green technology in general, it means like, uh, for example, for batteries, we need lithium, cobalt, graphite, all these kind of critical raw materials, but they have to be extracted, of course. And uh, for example, in the European Parliament, I was fighting for a balanced uh, view, means like we know that we need that for change, yeah, for green change. But on the other hand, we shouldn't do mining, for example, in Europe in protected areas. Mm -hmm. You know, I was the only one, I mean, the Greens were the only group in the European Parliament fighting for that, so you can see how uh, important that is, you know, how it's still exceptional you have to have such a balanced view, but it's very important in long-term perspective that first of all, that we have the raw materials, but on the other hand, that we also can substitute it, right? That mm -hmm. we invest in research and development to substitute critical raw materials and that we put our focus on circular economy, you know, because then in the long-term view, we don't need any more such a huge amount of critical raw materials because we know it's, it's rising, the demand because we need that change, right? But we have to change our production processes that doesn't refer in such an amount as now on critical raw materials. So we can actually get to a point where we're recycling these raw materials, you're saying, but initially it's gonna take some uh, energy to extract. How do we do that and still protect the natural environment? You're touching upon it. I'd love to hear some more. Yeah, I mean, of course, in all that package, it's very important, um, first of all, to invest massively in renewable energies and also to put our focus on energy efficiency. And uh, this is a very, very important part. And also we recently worked on the industrial strategy, um, on the European industrial strategy in the European Parliament. And we put uh, very much our focus on that. And 
Um, I think um, it's, uh, we have lots of facets that have to belong together, right, um, to go in the right direction to implement the Green Deal and to fight against climate change. And we have to pick all, the, uh, all these facets and uh, change something. Uh, what is in the long term view also making our economy, the European economy, but also, of course, um, the American economy resilient and competitive and sustainable at the same time. So how do you do that in partnership with industry as well? So you're speaking as a policymaker, bringing the government perspective, but we ultimately need public-private partnerships to really successfully see this through and really make sure that the outcomes, the benefits, are, are enjoyed widely by communities, especially where some of these uh, extractions are taking place, and that also we see future um, just distribution of, of these outcomes, of these minerals, and of the products that come from these minerals. So where does industry come into this? How do those relationships, uh, you know, planning them in advance now, how will that ensure that the benefits really are enjoyed by all? That's a very good point, and I think, you know, the industry plays a very important role here, and this is very interesting for me here in Washington as well, to have a dialogue with the industry, because First of all, we need that the industry really refers to sustainable technology, that they invest in the future in sustainable technology. And we have developed in the European Parliament uh, lots of tools for supporting the industry in doing that. It means like, of course, we regulate at, the, at, the, at uh, the one side, and on the other hand, we have incentives like CBAM, for example. CBAM as a uh, carbon border uh, adjustment mechanism is something that could function in Europe in a wonderful way that prevents carbon leakage as well. And of course, it would be interesting to use that kind of tool to, in to develop it in the States as well and to use it here too. And we have also uh, carbon contracts for difference. That is very important and also uh, a tool that uh, helps the industry you know, to, to, to develop and um, new technology, but also to bring it on the market. You know, so the taxpayer supports that process. So we have different tools that really can help. And I think we need a pact with the industry, you know, for the climate. And we have to, to realize that in Europe as well as in the States and maybe as well on both sides of the Atlantic together because we can only fight against the climate change together, of course. Absolutely. And industry can help accelerate so much of this, so much of the policy uh, not only will we see some of these solutions come into fruition thanks to innovation and support from industry, but we also can see policies making it easier for industry to be able to bring those solutions to the table. So that partnership is so key and so critical. How, how do we balance industry's interest in, of course, um, advancing these technologies for, the, for profit purposes with the environmental impact that we're hoping to achieve, the reduced environmental impact and the benefit that these technologies will bring to the wider communities and for future generations. So how do we balance business interests versus what's good for the planet and people generally? I mean, it's a wonderful uh, way to do that, like when you use uh, public money that you um, pay attention that it's invested in a sustainable way. So this is a very important tool. So public procurement, for example, is very important in that regard. But I mean, in general, like in the European Parliament, we paid attention to the fact as Greens um, that uh, we have a certain percentage, of means 50 percentage of all the money we spend in the EU budget is climate related, you know, for climate protection. So this is something that the states could develop as well, you know, a tool to uh, that helps to evaluate how much money is spended for the climate. So it means like what we can do is we can regulate uh, at the one time, at the one side, and on the other hand, we can also uh, combine all the investments we have with the climate protection issue at the same time. And you know, uh, with the corona uh, pandemic that we had, that we experienced still, um, of course, we uh, intended to spend a lot of money in the European context, and it was very important that we combine that together with that climate issue, because um, we know that this is uh, a real um, challenge at the moment, you know, to make uh, the economy resilient again. Yeah, we have inflation, we have, all, we have the ener high energy prices and all the challenges. But on the other hand, we really have to think in a long-term perspective that 
when we have money that we want to spend, that we spend it in a way that it protects the climate and environment, because otherwise we just fall from one emergency to right. the next one. So those are really written into the policies. That's Thank you for making that clear. That's good to know, and that's good to share with our audience. So we can feel confident about, especially green members of parliament, really ensuring that that language is in there and that these partnerships with the industry truly do benefit all, or that's the intention. So let's, let's move uh, to a new area that is going to be of interest to those who are not in the European Union, who are going to be learning a little bit about what may be hearing for the first time, what the European Union taxonomy is. So for those who don't know, even though it's been in global news, but for those who may not be familiar, talk to us a little bit about what this is and what are your thoughts, especially in light of recent, uh, recent news? Yes. Yeah, that was something uh, we were working on since quite a while, since a year now, and that was very important for us Greens as well, uh, because taxonomy is a classification system that classifies act economic activities as sustainable. So it is, of course, very important how you define sustainable. And the Commission made a proposal that was on the 21st December, right before New, new Year, um, declaring that um, gas and fossil fuels are sustainable as well. And, um, you know, of course, what we have as a chance now with taxonomy is to have a real credible label, you know, what is sustainable and what is not sustainable um, as orientation for the financial industry, right, the uh, financing industry. And um, so it's a huge change that the European Union has here to have a gold standard and mm -hmm. to, to show, well, we know what sustainable is, so we can orientate on, on that. And, but actually, you know, we had this commission proposal on the table and then uh, the parliament reacted, of course. So first of all, uh, the Econ Committee, the Economy Committee and the Environmental Committee had the position against that view that nuclear and fossil energy is sustainable. And then recently in Strasbourg, in the plenary, uh, unfortunately, the majority of the plenary voted with the, with the uh, commission's proposal. Mm. Means at the very end, we have now a classification system that is no more valid, right? Because from our green perspective, it is like, you can't tell that nuclear energy and fossil energy is sustainable, it's just not true, yeah? It's stranded assets, it's dangerous, we all know all the details. So the European Union missed the chance to develop a gold standard, you know, to give orientation, to mm. take the leadership here in climate issues. And we were, of course, um, very sad about that because we, we fought, we were fighting for every single uh, voting um, uh, in the European Parliament, but on the other hand, we have the Fit for 55 package now, which is much more important, and we make progress also at the European level towards climate protection, which is much more important than only this single uh, taxonomy issue. But of course, it was you know one step you win, and the next one you lose. And but it's it's very important to make progress in general, and this is what we're doing. We fight against climate change also in Brussels in an effective way. Yeah, sure. What To what extent was this, was this taxonomy decision influenced by the war in Ukraine? Would you say that that had a big impact on why we saw these different um, energy sources being labeled the way that they have been labeled? And in Germany especially, seeing coal fire plants firing back up is must be really difficult for somebody who's representing the green communities, the green constituency. How do you, how do you um, explain the influence of what's happening in Ukraine on some of these efforts that are happening out of the European Parliament? Well, I think, you know, during the taxonomy uh, process and our uh, negotiations, it was very clear that the fossil lobby is very, very um, powerful, also in Brussels, so it, it, it plays a role. And I think in general we had, since uh, the war in Europe started, um, an agreement much more, for, uh, also, you know, all the other groups agree much more than ever before that we have to invest in mass massively in renewable energies to get independent, you know, also because of geopolitical reasons, not only because of um, ecological reasons, but for us that was always the most important argument, but now we have also conservative groups going in a different direction. 
So actually, but it wasn't influenced somehow because uh, you would expect that, um, if, you know, in the context of the war of in, in Ukraine, that people are more serious now, you know, that they say, oh yeah, you know, inflation, we have a fossil fuel inflation, uh, fossil fuel inflation, you know, which is caused by fossil fuels. We have um, a consciousness about that, that we really have to go in a different direction now, far away from fossil fuels and nuclear energy that endangers now our supply in mm -hmm. Europe you know, because we can't refer to Russian um, uh, gas anymore or, you know, in a way that it was the case before, that you would expect uh, a different reaction, but actually, no, we have still the conservative mm. movement here mm. and the fossil fuel lobby that really uh, did a great uh, amount of work. But, uh, yeah, let's see. This is uh, one chapter, but we didn't read the whole book, right? We still uh, work on... on uh, going on and to work against climate change. I'm with you. It's counterintuitive. You would think the war in Europe would actually move us away from fossil fuels because we're, fossil fuels is, is actually contributing to this petro dictator and his war machine, right? Exactly. But the outcome is people are still relying on oil and gas. And we haven't made the transition fast enough to show that alternative alternatives are available that actually create better national security and global security. So this is an important point and a narrative that we hope uh, reaches ears, fights those conservative right-wing groups, and actually, through science and evidence, makes the case for why we would all benefit from a clean energy transition. So I'm with you. It's counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about um, what is it that democracies can do to make sure that uh, that industry is really held accountable. We talked a little bit about green policies and um, making sure that incentives are in place to support equal distribution of some of these technologies and outcomes and benefits, especially as it relates to um, critical minerals mining, but many other solutions that are in the pipeline, already here and are in the pipeline. But there's still companies that are trying to get away with greenwashing. And there's a role for policymakers to play here to hold companies accountable, especially those that aren't being transparent. How do you think about this? How can we support companies that are trying to do the right thing and at the same time really hold companies accountable that continue to greenwash? That's a very good question. And I think, uh, you know, we have, to, we have to do both, right? We have, first of all, um, to regulate, of course, that we say, well, for example, in, we, in the European Parliament, we have the poly to pace principle, means like um, the one, the unit that is responsible for pollution has to take care of it, has to pay for that as well, you know. And of course, we know that the European Union uh, is a country, is um, a body that is uh, very diverse, you know. So if you um, talk to the industry in Poland, it's a very different than if you talk to the industry in Germany, for example, you know, the kind of obligations they have, the kind of, um, you know, law enforcement, you know, even if the government um, uh, tells the industry that you are partly responsible for that, it doesn't mean necessarily that they really pay the, amount, the fine, you know, at the very end. This is what I recently uh, found out about. So actually what we have to do is we have to find a regulation that uh, takes um, the industry into obligation, you know, to uh, to, um, to work in a sustainable way. This is what we do, for example, with the industry strategy we just work on, and we will have in the plenary uh, after this summer. And on the other hand, uh, you have to work with incentives, the one I mentioned before, you know, some tools that um, makes the industry realize as well additionally that they have an advantage, a real advantage, you know, uh, besides the obligation, and this has to cooperate somehow, right? We have to be in a dialogue because we all know we can't achieve the climate goals just by restrictions, yeah, but we have to, we have to work together and use all instruments we can use for that. And there's, there's upcoming global convenings that can get us there, or I can, I can at least send a signal to the standards that we are insisting from one another from countries and also from industries and industry leads. So I'm referring to COP27, which is coming up. What are you anticipating um, that will come out of COP27, especially as it relates to not the big picture of our climate goals, because we already know that we there's much work to be done there, but how this global convening can really set the standard for industry and, and shed some light into companies that um, haven't always been so transparent. 
I think there are so many um, issues we can work on on the next COP. And uh, for example, it would be very important, you know, to have a treaty, you know, a, a binding treaty that somehow shows in what direction we have to go. Uh, then that we have also uh, to invest in research and development because this is very important for industrial policy. Mm -hmm. You know, the new technology we need for that conversion is very important. But of course, it has to be supported here in the United States. You know, uh, lots of industries have a lot of money they spend for research and development, but this is not necessarily the case for small, smaller and medium enterprises, or what about the startups, for example, right? So um, you also need public money for research and development, because that's very important for the transformation process. And I think an important uh, COP goal would be as well to look at sectors like trans the transportation sector, but also uh, to protect climate activists. That's a different topic, right, besides mm -hmm. the industry. But uh, I think the COP is uh, taking care of so many um, uh, broader topics than, than that. But um, there are millions of uh, things we can change. And I, th I really hope that COP is not only symbolic, Yeah, that really we have res results and uh, you know, that will implement further details on uh, pushing um, the work against climate change. Since you brought up activists at COP27, I must ask you, do you think the activists will get what they want? Will we be able to actually see maybe some country delegation leaders, no, not naming any names, but I'm sure our audience will know exactly who we're talking about here, that would be held accountable for their lack of environmental stewardship? I'm talking about Will any of these leaders at any point ever be charged with ecocide? Is that something that's in their future? Is that something activists will succeed in achieving? Yeah, I mean, the exit uh, aspect is very important. We picked it up in the European Parliament as well, and it, we support that approach. It's very important. But I think we can win much more if we put everything in a positive narrative, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because this is it's important and it's right, you know, that uh, also um, we have to take care that uh, institutions or persons be held responsible for their action also in a, in a in such a, a legal way. But on the other hand, we really have to work as politicians. Of course, I work in, uh, I think, in the possibilities in what kind of concepts we have, what kind of solutions we have. And I think climate activists play a very important role in that process because you give the dynamics. I do remember you know, how so many elections recently have uh, influenced in Germany by activists, and they have to push the politicians, right, in a way that they really fight for climate change and against the climate change. And I think, um, to be frank, uh, there's always in that process the danger of being disappointed. For me, as a green politician as mm -hmm. well, right, it's always not ambitious enough. It's not ambitious enough what we're doing in Brussels at the moment, you know, working against towards climate change, but we have to find compromises and everything. It takes too long. We don't have any time. So I really, we, we, we have to handle that kind of disappointment and transform it in a positive power <laughs> that we really work together, right, and that we do something. And there are millions of options to do something against the climate change. And if we do that together, political actors, the industry, um, you know, like a society movement, then we can really achieve that. We have no time, we have no other option than to do that together. You're saying politicians have to be positive. I wish, I mean, I wish our politicians were like you. <laughs> Please keep doing what you're doing. That's exactly right. We need to be positive. We need to be optimistic. That's how we mobilize. We, uh, we encourage people to act and to find hope in the future, because this could potentially be a better, brighter future than we've ever created as, as a human race we can actually see a future that is equitable for the first time ever. So there's a lot of potential here, and we have to keep that positivity up. So as much as I want to agree with you that politicians are positive, you are special, you're unique, and if you can use some of that energy and transform some of the politicians here we, we have here in the United States that are holding up climate legislation from passing, then I think we would go a long way into seeing that future come into being. So. We, we feel it from you. Keep it, keep it going, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will. And on that note, who would you like to give climate love to? So what we do here uh, at We Don't Have Time is we like to uh, support those that are doing really great climate work and give them a shout out in the form of climate love. So who would you like to? It could be an individual, it could be a company, organization, but who would you like to share some climate love with? 
I'm incredibly impressed by the NGOs who fight against the climate change, against, environment, against the environmental, uh, environmental damage here in the States because they are so inspiring and so informed and they don't give up. I recently met some people also in that direction and I think I would love to give all my love to them and all my support. And if we from the European side can support you, we would love to do that because I think there are so many tools and instruments we could use together and I think they do extraordinary work and they have to push the politicians, the government, um, really to make a movement, you know, to, to, uh, to do something here and, and we can do that. So all my love goes to the NGOs working in that sector. Okay, so thank you for sharing that climate love. Henrique, now who would you give climate warning to? I think you have pretty soon the midterm elections, which is a very serious issue, of course, in the States, but also for, for us all uh, in the world, right? Because it will be important, uh, you know, with regard to climate action. And um, I would like to um, give a serious concern or ser serious considerations um, to the Republican Party, of course, you know, because I think um, what they do is uh, when, they when they prevent climate action, is that they taking away the chances of a future generation in a way that is so dramatic. If you don't take care of the planet, if you don't take care of the United States and um, its benevolence, right, in a, in a long-term view as well, you don't do the right thing. So I, I really hope that um, not only strategic electoral considerations play a role for the Republican Party, but also, you know, serious arguments, science, you know, what people want, what the young generation wants, that they really make good politics to take into consideration how to make the economy resilient, but sustainable at the same time, but they, that they also pursue um, a political way that really implements or focuses uh, pro climate protection and green um, and, and environmental protection in the heart of every political action, because this is the only thing that you have um, politics made for the future. You have managed to turn a climate warning question into something so positive. We need this energy here in the U.S. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, your perspectives, and your expertise on how we really transition to a clean, green future economy. And let this be inspiring to those who are who are anticipating future careers in politics. We need more green politicians like yourself. So thank you for everything you, you do. Continue to fight the good fight. And thank you for joining us in our We Don't Have Time Washington DC studio. Safe travels onwards. Thank you very much.